by the miracle of unmerited favor. Jackson Snyder presents is back. Greetings, my friends. I am so glad to be with you as your host today, Brother Shrumpov. And I'm here at boot camp in Beulah Land in Tennessee on top of mountain with all my wonderful friends and colleagues, ordained ministers of the Ahad, families, lots of kids. We are uh, just finishing up dinner here and we are eating Snicker Bar and drinking a little kosher wine, of course, Smoke and David. And I'm going to give you a recording of this afternoon's meeting with Brother Onia Carlson, who is giving us teasers, we call them, little snippets of information that help us to want to know more about Dead Sea Scroll. And he's also, in a way, gives us a link <laughs> to a $13,000 collection of the Dead Sea Scrolls we can get for free as long as we can keep it up. Uh, are we doing recording for any of these next teachings or not? Brother, I'm, go I'm right now, Brother Shroomkoff is here to get your recording and I'm fixing you up right now for your afternoon. And I am going to record you today, tonight too. So I'm going to ask you please, Brother Carlson, no more wine, no more bourbon, no more cigarette. Okay? Okay, because it's time to go in five minutes. Now I can show you who's in charge here as Brother Shroomkoff. That is a fact. So I hope you enjoy the lecture here, and we've got more of Brother Carlson coming up pretty soon. Now get yourself a nice piece of cheese, a little glass of cheap wine, piece of bread, and say a prayer uh, for your old brother here. All right, everybody. If you don't know him. I want to introduce Onia Carlson, who probably knows <coughs> intertestamental literature and New Testament apocrypha better than anyone I know. And I, I thank you for coming. Before I get into the, the stuff, I just want to say uh, I was having a conversation with a friend recently about movements and uh, his concern for movements, and I share a similar concern in the sense of we want to make sure that movements are are of God or of Yahuwah, of the Creator, and so uh, that's a concern that I think we, we need to be careful and we need to try to, uh, if this is going to be successful, it has it has to be focused in the right way and it has to be open to criticism and discussion, and I think I'm an important part of that in that I will challenge other things that people share with you guys uh, and the leaders of the group. I'm I'm willing to challenge what is being said. I think it's an important process of testing the teaching that is part of this. Uh, so that's what I just wanted to, to say. That I think uh, this is a great goal to try to uh, follow the Essene way, but I think it definitely needs to uh, be tested to, to make sure we're going to be on the right path. And so, basically, I want to share a little bit of my background. Uh, I grew up Protestant, and uh, I began trying to seek the truth of the scriptures myself. I, I wanted the truth. And so, as I was studying the scriptures, I, I saw that it, the Bible itself was teaching things that was contrary to what the church taught me. And basically what I saw was that uh, the Bible was saying that other books are scripture, are divinely inspired. And that kind of set me on a quest of trying to find as many of those books that should be part of the Bible as I could. And that eventually led to my desire to uh, start my own version of the Bible, because I thought it was such an important thing of what should and should not be in the Bible, that that was really what uh, was placed on my heart. And so that is kind of the origin of how I became a, a scribe. And that goal eventually led me to the faith of the Dead Sea Scrolls, because, as I said, I was looking for other books, and the Dead Sea Scrolls has the, these other books. And so I began studying the Dead Sea Scrolls, and 
just became fascinated by them, and I just became convinced that these are the real deal and that these are very special writings and we need to incorporate them uh, for the restoration of the ancient ways, the ancient path. And uh, let's see, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, my goal in trying to restore the Dead Sea Scrolls is principally through uh, the scriptures, using the Dead Sea Scrolls as a source for uh, trying to, to, to discover what the true version of the Bible is. And uh, through my studies, I have been able to uh, have a great understanding of the ancient sources of the Bible. And uh, so I, was, I wanted to say something else, but it, I don't remember what I was going to say. But so basically, I'm just going to dive right into this and start discussing... Uh, oh, here, here's what I was going to say. is basically, you know, with... Uh, I, Jackson's movement uh, that he desires to start is considers the Dead Sea Scrolls a very important part of the picture. But there's a difference between my perspective and Jackson's, and I think my perspective is an important element that should be considered by 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 the group of Jackson because uh, it's kind of like just to draw an analogy. This may not be the best analogy, but uh, when, when studying the Quran, for example, uh, most people have a strong anti-Quran bias which prevents them from being able to understand many passages and interpreting it fairly. And so, in a similar way, when you're looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls, if you're, if you're approaching it more as an outsider, you may have a harder time understanding certain parts of it. And I think with someone like me, who, who I accept the Dead Sea Scrolls as the foundation of my faith, I accept every word of scripture as authoritative in my life, and so I think that perspective that I have it can be... A very helpful way for other people to understand the perspective of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then I'll share my perspective. It doesn't mean it's the same as Jackson's, but what it means is I'm giving you another vantage point, and you can take that information and test it for yourselves and see what I say does it ring true or does it not, and I leave it up to you to figure out the implications of the information I share. But so... Uh, basically, the Dead Sea Scrolls, before I discuss the modern discovery, there's actually something really interesting which uh, basically convinces me that Dead Sea Scrolls are uh, divinely inspired in the sense or that their discovery was divinely orchestrated. And the reason I conclude that is there were events that surrounded the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls which could not just be coincidence, they could not just be man-caused. And really, the history of this goes back to the 9th century AD, when a Syrian uh, patriarch of Christianity, he, he wrote a letter, his name was Timotheos, and he wrote a letter describing something very similar to the modern discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. He basically wrote a letter to someone explaining, uh, he heard from credible Jews, in his mind he said they were credible because they converted to Christianity, and so they wouldn't lie about this, and... and uh, and what they were telling him was uh, that the dog of an Ar of an Arab uh, wandered into some caves, and they were going after the dog, and they found a bunch of scrolls. And this story is very reminiscent of what happened in modern times with involved animals. There was a story of a bird that led uh, that led the Arabs to the fourth cave, and there was a story of a goat that led the Arabs to the first cave that was discovered of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So <clears throat> that alone is just an amazing coincidence of it was the Arabs finding it, and it was the animals uh, leading them to find it. And when it's, when it's animals involved, unprovoked, that suggests a, a divine orchestration, because humans, it could easily be a conspiracy of humans doing things, but when it's animals of their own accord doing this, then it really speaks of something higher than man's uh, doing. And there's just so many similarities between the two discoveries. Uh, the, the, Syrian, the Syrian Orthodox Church was very interested in the modern discovery. Uh, they decided to buy some of the main first Dead Sea Scrolls. And, and in the same way, the, the Syrian patriarch the, in the 9th century, he was just really interested. He really wanted to get copies of this and find out. And he, and he went into detail of saying, it is evident that these these copies are more authoritative than, than our copies, and we should be looking at these copies to see how can we correct our Bibles to a more trustworthy Bible version. And uh, he said not only 
uh, was it just these Jews who were telling him, but he went and investigated and he was asking all different types of witnesses. And he said they all told the same story without a difference. And so he knew that this had to be the case. Um, and there's just so many similarities. Uh, so I actually did a teaching on that before and I do have the, the letter posted online. So I can also show you guys later in more detail the, the amazing connections. But these things just really convinced me of the Dead Sea Scrolls being uh, truly uh, orchestrated for us to find them. And uh, the modern discovery was found in, this, uh, in 1948. The first cave was found in the, in the same year that Israel as a state was restored. Then the, the Temple Scroll was recovered during the, the I think it was the Six Day War when they recovered Jerusalem. So is all this coincidence, or is this uh, strongly suggesting that this these are highly significant events, and they're restored to us for a reason, and that's what we had to figure out. What is the reason they restored to us? And I believe it is that we are to look to these scrolls, see what they say, and then try to see how we can apply them to our lives and see what truths they contain. And so there were 11 caves that were found. They all had writing in them, except two of the caves were poorly represented. They barely had anything in them, like they had like a jar with writing on them or something, but all the other caves actually did have fragments. The first cave was discovered in like 1948, and then up until like around 1956 was when the other ten caves were found. Then it took a long time for scholars to publish these documents. It was mainly motivated by uh, copyright issues and greed for money. But eventually, through the efforts of several scholars, such as Robert Eisenman and others affiliated with him, they they brought the Dead Sea Scrolls to light and made it public, and basically forced the publication of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so, that happened right around the time I was born. I try not to read that into that too much, but maybe that's significant. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know... And then, ever since then, there's been great scholarship being done by the Dead sea, uh, about the Dead Sea Scrolls. I think a lot of the scholarship is false, but I think it's great scholarship in the sense it's really forcing people to ask questions and to consider the value of these writings. And uh, what's very interesting is that all the Dead Sea Scrolls have not been published yet. They are still being acquired. They're, they're still owned by uh, some of the Arabs, and they're trying to to purchase them so that they can publish some new ones, and so there's quite a number of uh, approaching about a hundred fragments still of various books uh, that haven't been published yet. There's two books coming out in August which are gonna be publishing some of these fragments for the first time. Something like I don't know, maybe I don't have the exact number, but it could be something like twenty fragments that we haven't seen before. And we'll be seeing that for the first time. And apparently, there are some, there is at least one or two major differences that are extremely important according to their teaser, but they're not telling us until uh, it, it gets published. So I'm going to be getting that and I'm going to see the importance of that. But so that's kind of the history of the uh, publication of it. And now the content is, here's what I'm going to say about the content is we found copies of the books of the Bible that we're familiar with, of the Old Testament, but we also found books of the Bible that uh, are outside the standard canon of the Jews and Christians. Uh, some of them we're familiar with, we knew about before, and others we never heard about before, and we find, we're finding them out the first time. And so I'm going to kind of give a little bit of an overview of those documents and the significance of them from my perspective, because as I said, I have essentially converted to the Dead Sea Scroll faith, and I accept all those documents as basically my Bible, the most accurate uh, parts of my Bible. And so... I have a unique perspective on these books, and so that's what I'm going to talk about, give as a teaser. Now, uh, probably the most, the way, the way I approach it is the older writings, or the, old, the writings purporting to be the older writings, are the foundation, they're the, they're the more important ones than the ones that come later. And so, really, you start with uh, the writings of Enoch, and what we found, many fragments of Enoch, and we also found some fragments of another Enoch book, uh, which we didn't really have much fragments of any substantial length prior to the Dead Sea Scrolls of the Book of Giants, it's called. And it, and it gives much greater detail to the story of the Nephilim than the Book of Enoch does. And there are strong indications that the Book of Giants is actually a key source of Book of Enoch. And uh, 
We also discovered that the calendar section of Enoch, Enoch chapters 72 through 82, in the Dead Sea Scroll copies is actually significantly longer and suggests that the scribes uh, shortened the text of Enoch for various reasons. And so that's an important discovery that the Dead Sea Scrolls have shown us. It shows us that even our copies of Enoch are not uh, preserved in their original form in every place. There have been some changes. And now after the, the Enoch and, and uh, Giants comes a very important document I consider uh, more important than Genesis itself and more important than the Book of Jubilees, and that is the Genesis Apocryphon. Scholars consider the Genesis Apocryphon a single document by a single author, but I disagree with that. I believe Genesis Apocryphon uh, it claims to be by at least three different writers, and I, believe, and I believe they were written by those three writers. And the three books in this Genesis Apocryphon are a book by the father of Noah, Book of Lamech, in the first person. There's also a book by in, in the first person by Noah, and there's a book by Abraham. And the significance of these these writings, if they are truly the source of Genesis, cannot be understated, uh, cannot be overstated. Uh, and so, basically, uh, for for instance, the Lamech book again, like Giants, it suggests that the Book of Enoch had a source of a a more fuller version, uh, and that the scribes, or no, not the scribes, but uh, Enoch shortened the original story for various reasons, and so. Basically, in Enoch chapters 106 to 107, it tells the same story that the Book of Lamech does, but it's like a teeny tiny version, whereas the Book of Lamech tells it in great in many details. And the evidence seems to indicate that that Lamech story comes before Enoch's version. And then, uh, Jubilees is an important source, because Book of Jubilees... Uh, we, we, we had Jubilees before the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. There was a whole bunch of things that Jubilees was talking about, which we had no knowledge about. Jubilees was mentioning books that these men wrote. Jubilees said that Noah uh, wrote a book, that Abraham wrote a book, that Jacob wrote a book, and yet we did not have any indication that they did, but then the, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, and the Genesis Apocryphon, once they were able to publish it, uh, we start reading Genesis Apocryphon, and we start comparing it to Jub Jubilees, and we're seeing that... Uh, the stories in Genesis Apocryphon are matching Jubilees, so it's clear that Jubilees was actually derived from Genesis Apocryphon, and that Genesis was derived from this Genesis Apocryphon. And so, uh, also, when you compare the parallels between the passages in Genesis and the passages in the Genesis Apocryphon, like with Noah's book and Abraham's book, what we see is that Genesis, the author of Genesis, has significantly condensed and edited the original story, not so much adding things, rather removing details and rearranging text. So, for example, in the passage of, uh, let's see, the passage of the covenant that Yahuwah makes with Noah, that he will never send uh, a flood again, and with the rainbow covenant and the, the, the blood <coughs> covenant not to eat blood, all that is found in the book of Noah, but in much greater detail, and sometimes even the clauses are in a different order. So it just suggests that what we have in Genesis is just a fraction of the story. And that's very significant. If this is truly the authentic source of Genesis, then we need to start reading this and making it the, the foundation of our faith. Uh, let's see, then, uh, unfortunately with the Genesis Apocryphon, uh, the beginning and ending are missing, and it's very fragmentary in certain places. So we're missing quite a lot, but what we have is enough uh, to really give us some great uh, wisdom and nourishment. Then also was found some fragments which suggest that there was a another Book of Jubilees that once existed, uh, before the Book of Jubilees. And there, there, you compare the fragment that was found, it's, it's similar in many ways to what we have in Jubilees, but there's too many differences in, to, to suggest it's the same text. It suggests that there was another Jubilees that's completely gone now. And I believe that this other Jubilees was, in fact, a, a version of, uh, like, a book of Jubilees that was given to Abraham. The, the book of Jubilees that we know of was given to Moses. And what it does is, in Jubilees, as I said, it's based on the Genesis Apocryphon and Enoch. And so it's using scripture, giving an overview 
to Moses. And Jubilees tells us that that's the exact same thing that the angels did with Abraham, that for six months, the angel sat down with Abraham and gave him an overview of the entire of all the scriptures that existed and explained to Abraham the parts that he could not understand. So that's a complete parallel with the book of Jubilees, but for Abraham. So this fragment that was found, I believe, uh, scholars call it pseudo-Jubilees. I don't think it's an accurate way to, to label this text. Uh, I think a better text would be, to, a, a better label would be proto-Jubilees. It's the, the, the version of Jubilees that the book of Jubilees was based on, uh, I believe. And so, uh, so there was a fragment of that found. Um, and there was also fragments found of Jubilees itself and many copies. In fact, copies of Jubilees and Enoch were found more so than many books of the Old Testament that we're familiar with, which suggests that these whoever compiled the Dead Sea Scrolls treasured Jubilees and Enoch more than many books of the Bible of the, that we're familiar with. Uh, now, there was also, uh, that was found, testaments of... Uh, the, there was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, Jacob had 12 sons, and we're familiar with those. Those are the founders, the fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, before the Dead Sea Scrolls, we were familiar with uh, a text called the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. That's a, it, it survives in Greek, and we were also familiar of some Aramaic fragments uh, of some of the Testaments. And we found also in the Dead Sea Scrolls fragments once as, as well of these uh, Testaments, but not all the Testaments because... Dead Sea Scrolls, it's, it's hit and miss. There's a lot of things missing because of fragments, and it's unintentional, it's coincidence of what is and is not found many times. And so, of the twelve patriarchs that wrote their testaments, only two of those testaments were de definitely found in the Dead Sea Scrolls in fragments, and those were Naphtali and Levi. There was also a Hebrew version of, of Naphtali that the rabbis preserved for us, but it's probably been polluted by some of their rabbinic uh, language, but I do believe much of that Hebrew version of the Testament of Naphtali is authentic. And basically, what these discoveries of Aramaic and Hebrew versions of the Testaments of the, of the Twelve Sons of Jacob, what those Hebrew and Aramaic versions indicate to us is that the Greek version has also been significantly condensed from the original text. So, the original testaments were much longer. Uh, so once again, these are, these are scribes changing things uh, for various reasons. U usually what I've found in my studies is that the scribes condense things out of the laziness, basically, and sometimes, not themselves being lazy, but it was their readers they were concerned about. And they were like, well, my, our readers are not going to be interested in this stuff, so how can we edit this to make it more relevant to them or something they want to read? And so they, they change things to make it shorter. And, you know, it, it, you know with sermons in, in, that in church, if you guys remember from Christianity, uh, sermons that last for, like, hours on end are very difficult for people to, to be focused. They're not going to be interested. But if you can condense that sermon to 30 minutes, maybe, or less, then it's, it won't be too bad for people. They'll, they'll be interested. They'll follow along. And that's basically what happened with the scriptures not just these extra books, but even in our Bibles, the regular Old Testament, that is essentially what has happened with er almost every book uh, from what I've seen. So, uh, what's also... Uh, uh, let me give an example of the different changes that were made in the Testament. Uh, so, in the Greek version, it mentions that Levi prayed, did a prayer. In the, he in the Aramaic fragments that were found, it gives the entire prayer that he gave. So, in the condensed version... It just says he prayed, but it doesn't say what he prayed. It just skips that entirely. Uh, another another example is, it, it gives in the Greek version, uh, it says that Levi was taught the, uh, the law of the priesthood by his, uh, his uh, grandfather Isaac. And it gives some of those laws, but mostly just very much skips over. It says, there's like a line that says, and he taught Levi the law of these and these and these and these sacrifices. And that's it. But in the Aramaic fragments, it goes into great detail of, and then you're to do this for each type of sacrifice. It goes into great detail. It's like to a point like, you know, like Leviticus. Leviticus goes into great detail of how to do sacrifices. Many Christians or just many believers of the Bible, when they read Leviticus, it's like, do I have to read this? I'm just going to skip this. It's just details which are hard for people to understand and doesn't seem relevant to a lot of us. And that's kind of what this Testament of Levi in the original version, it had like a very lengthy stuff where it would probably be tedious for a lot of people to read through. So the Greek version simply decided 
let's just shorten this so that people have the basic understanding, but they don't need to know all these sacrifices because it's not even important anyway. This is Commander Lee. We've got to take a break now for some important but feckless platitudes. We'll be right back after you get your daily dose. We're back. I hope you enjoyed the feckless platitudes. We can compare the testaments with Jubilees and we can see that Jubilees was also based not just on Genesis Apocrypha, but Ju one of Jubilees' sources was the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. Then we see two Testaments in the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, that were found, which we never knew about before, and that is by Moses' grandfather named Kohath, or Kohath, and there was only a fragment of that found. And then there were several copies in fragmentary form found of Moses' own father named Amram. And what's significant about the Testament of Amram is it also connects with Jubilees in an amazing way, which which suggests that uh, Jubilees also was based on this testament. And it's just, these are just amazing things uh, corroborating what Jubilees is saying, and we just, we would not have had any knowledge of this prior to the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's just an amazing confirmation. It's another witness to the same stories. And, you know, the scripture talks about two or three witnesses, so when you have multiple witnesses saying the same stories, it's harder to conclude that it was forged uh, by scribes as a false story. Uh, so it's an important... The Dead Sea Scrolls are important for corroborating certain elements of some of these writings, which some people might have been skeptical of. Uh, now, after the Testaments, let's see here. Also, what was found... Uh, okay, so now I'm going to go into the Law of Moses. And basically, we found copies of the Law of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Uh, some of the copies, scholars say, are much closer to our version uh, than other copies in the scrolls. And uh, basically, some copies in the scrolls that were found... The, the, the scholars call them reworked pent Pentateuch, reworked Pentateuch. But from my perspective, it's like, aren't they making an assumption? They're making an assumption based from their perspective of the Masoretic text, as if the Masoretic text was the original version. Uh, but e even the scholarship, you know, the whole documentary hypothesis thing, they have concluded that there were sources that are the current version of the Torah were based on, and so. Couldn't it very well be that this reworked Pentateuch is the original or older version of the books of the Torah? And that's what I believe. And in these copies, we, we see much longer passages in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. And the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, let me just say, overall, everything found in the Dead Sea Scrolls corroborates other witnesses of copies of the scriptures that were found before the Dead Sea Scrolls. Of, so there's the Septuagint, that's the Greek version of the Old Testament. And there's also the Samaritan copies. Uh, the Samaritans only had in their Bible the Law of Moses, the five books. And so, uh, in the Samaritan copies and the Septuagint copies, we find some major differences, huge differences. Usually, it's the case that the Samaritan and Septuagint copies have many extra details and extra passages which are nowhere found in the Masoretic Hebrew, uh, copies. But the Dead Sea Scrolls actually corroborate these other witnesses of Septuagint and uh, Samaritan. And Jubilees corroborates it too, because sometimes Jubilees has passages which uh, are like almost verbatim the same as what Genesis says or Exodus says. And when it par has a parallel like that, very often Jubilees' text is a mixture of Septuagint, Samaritan forms. So all these witnesses together point to, uh, so the Dead Sea Scrolls that was found had many extra passages which were only found in the Septuagint and Samaritan. So all these witnesses together suggest that uh, the Masoretic text removed a lot of passages and details, and we need to use all these witnesses to try to reconstruct the Torah and what the original form was. But that's for Genesis through Numbers. Now, we go to Deuteronomy, and I basically came upon an, uh, came upon an amazing revelation back in 2011, is when it really started, and kind of finalized in 2012, uh, from my studies, and that was a document called the Temple Scroll. It's called the Temple Scroll by Scholars. That's not its actual name. Uh, there were several copies found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but none of them are complete. Uh, even the main copy of the Temple Scroll, the main copy... Uh, the beginning is missing, and the ending is missing. Not only that, uh, on every column of the text, the bottom portion, no wait, the top portion of the temple scroll on every column is missing. At least five lines are missing on every column, which is a horrible thing that happened. And, uh, and a side note is, when the temple scroll was found, they kept it in 
they didn't preserve it the best way. So it's actually possible that the people who found it damaged it more than it was found. And that is a very sad thing because if the scholars had gotten their hands on the Temple Scroll right from the start, then we might have had significantly more of the text. But we have to work with what we got. And so what we have is very significant because as you start going through the Temple Scroll, it doesn't seem anything like our Torah. But then it starts... As you start getting into it, it just starts getting so similar to Deuteronomy in a way that cannot be coincidence. And it's very clear that this document is claiming to be the original Deuteronomy. And I have found for myself compelling evidence that it has to be the original. And I have documented all this uh, in writings, and I can go through some of that material and other teachings for those interested. But so this is just a very significant thing, because if this is the case, that the Temple School is the original, you, you guys have heard how they talk about the 613 laws, that's complete bogus. That's not of any validity at all. If this is if this temple scroll is true, maybe it'd be something more like 1613 or something like that. You know, it's just many more commandments that simply have been removed. You know, you can give some, I can give some examples of like, uh, one extra law is a, uh, a woman who is pregnant and her, uh, a baby dies inside her she is to be gar- she is to be treated as if she's a grave. The uncleanness, uh, you know how the, the Torah talks about uh, uncleanness if you come in contact with a grave. Well, according to the Temple Scroll, this extra law is if you come in contact with a woman who has a, a dead fetus inside her, you have to treat her of that level of uncleanness, and, that, and that's not in our copies of the Torah. There, there's another law. The rabbis have a law that. Uh, they always like to find loopholes of things. So they have in our regular copies of the law, it basically states that uh, it states that a man cannot have sex with, but you know that's basically uh, synonymous with marrying. Cannot marry uh, his aunt. But the rabbis have their little way of uh, changing things and say, okay, well, yes, can't have relations with his aunt, but his niece. Well, it doesn't say he can't have it with your niece, so it's okay. But in the temple school, there's an actual extra law, which is, no, thou shall not have with your niece either. So it's very possible that the scribes removed that law uh, from our copies of... Well, they definitely removed that law. Uh, but uh, so there's just so many other examples. There's extra holy days in the temple school. And these extra holy days, they, ha- they have certain features of them. You- you're seeing hints to these things all throughout the rest of the Old Testament. So there's just a lot of compelling evidence that I've found that this is the original version of the law and... So that's going to put a huge, uh, that's a huge stumbling block for the Hebrew roots movement because they're all about trying to keep the Torah. But how can you keep the Torah if we don't have the Torah, if we don't have the full Torah? So that's going to, you know, we've got to figure out together what is truly the Torah and then try to apply that to our lives. And w- which, which commandments are still for today or, or some, do we, not, do we not need to keep certain parts anymore or do we need to keep, you know, that's all stuff we have to figure out and discuss as, as a group. And so, then after that comes, uh, what we see is, uh, the Psalm School. Again, it was found in the same cave as the Temple School. And this Psalm School, like, uh, like the Temple School, preserves for us an original version of Book of Psalms, which is significant, significantly different than our copies. It has extra Psalms in it. It has all the same Psalms that ours have, but it's in a very different order. Many extra details, passages. And in this Book of Psalms is also an extra passage, which corresponds with First Kings. Uh, First Kings has a passage which says, King Solomon was a very wise man. His wisdom came from Yahuwah. And he spoke 3,000 proverbs. And he spoke 1,005 songs. But we're only familiar with one song of Solomon, the song about his his sexual fantasies. Uh, you know, what happened to all his other songs? You know, there would have been so much wisdom in all those other songs, uh, the songs of Solomon. But we don't have them in our Bibles for some reason. Uh, the Proverbs, the 3,000 Proverbs, there's only 900 verses in the book of Proverbs. So where did all the other Proverbs go? There are some extra Proverbs found in the Dead Sea Schools, which very well may be uh, some of Solomon's, but it's, it's not absolutely certain, but I believe it was by Solomon. Uh, then, in the Septuagint version of Proverbs, uh, there's also many extra Proverbs. So there's things like that where, uh, where we're definitely missing some stuff, but that, that little notice that we have in Scripture of what Solomon wrote is a parallel in the Psalm School, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which, which says for David. So now think about this for a second. If Solomon wrote a thousand and five songs, according to the testimony of Scripture, how many songs did David write? Because David is the one that Scripture equates with the, the song, the guy that was the song master, and that 
uh, he was the one that was the musician. So if Solomon did 1,005, how many did David do? Well, according to the Psalm School, David did 4,050. And it divides it into different uh, uh, sections. It says 3,600 psalms he composed. And he did 450 songs. And he divided the songs into different groups. 364 songs for each day of the year. 52 songs for each day of, uh, for each Sabbath, the sac- uh, for the sacrifices of the Sabbath. And 30 songs for the festivals, the holy days. And four songs for exercising demons. Altogether, 450 songs. Now, what's significant is there is actually a bunch of extra psalms found in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Not anywhere approaching 3,600 or 4,050, but it's quite a number, something like 50 to 100, maybe even 150, depending how you might count them, but there's so many fragments of it. But, so we have a good amount of writings to indicate, well, there's much more stuff. Uh, so uh, one of the things that co- corroborates the psalm scroll is, as I said, it says that he wrote 52 songs for the Sabbath sacrifice, and there were multiple copies found in the Dead Sea Scrolls of songs of the Sabbath sacrifice. It doesn't say by David, but it said it, it corresponds with what Psalm Scroll says. So I believe that these Sabbath songs were attributed and written by David. And so there's just the the, the we can see right there. There's a the, there's a clear remnant of a much richer faith that is now just fragments. We don't just have it in fragments. Four songs of the daily songs were found outside of Dead Sea Scrolls, probably in that prior discovery of the scrolls that I mentioned back in the 9th century. Four songs of David, four, four days of the year, were found. Uh, they were in the Geniza, uh, Cairo Geniza. And um, so, it's just, that's just some amazing things right there. Uh, there's the Thanksgiving Psalms. A lot of scholars think that was written by the teacher of righteousness. I believe it was written by David. And I think that just like the book of Psalms as we have it, people read into those Psalms the experiences of the Messiah. In the same way, I think it's so easy to read into the experiences of whoever wrote the Thanksgiving Psalms. Oh, that, that sounds like the teacher of righteousness. That sounds like the Messiah, maybe. And I think that's a, not a coincidence. I think the, the language of these psalms is very similar to the Davidic psalms of our Bibles. But so we're just, that's just a clear evidence we're just missing a lot of stuff. Uh, then there's also interesting, some copies of Song of, Solomon's, uh, Song of Solomon found, and it's parts of the Song of Solomon are in a different order. So we see rearranging of text. Samuel scroll. That was one of the most important ones also found. There was a copy of Samuel that was found, and this Samuel scroll has much uh, much greater uh, details and passages, much longer, many of them agreeing with the Septuagint. And it also has a passage that Josephus mentions in his writings, but that passage is not in any other copies of the Bible that exist in any group, and it was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which suggests that all copies of Samuel go back to the same flawed text which had that passage missing. So it just shows uh, every book of Scripture is missing things. Uh, in First and Second Chronicles, uh, it speaks of many extra books of the prophets that was the source of First and Second Chronicles. It says, for, for more information about King David, you can go to these prophets. And it mentions uh, Gad the Seer, the book of Gad the Seer, the book of Nathan the prophet, the book of Samuel the Seer. And there's other books of different prophets that Chronicles refers us to. But all these books, mostly, are just completely gone. I've actually found through my trying to research these extra writings, I've found traces of these books quoted in some of the other writings. But other other than that, we, we don't have these books anymore. Uh, in the Dead Sea Schools was found extra prophecies, extra books of prophets. What we, can, we have two books of prophets which we can confirm with absolute certainty the identity of, and that is extra prophecies of Ezekiel and extra prophecies of Jeremiah. Those are two which by name we can know from the fragments. All the other books of the prophets, they don't preserve enough to tell us who they're attributed to. But we can know, trying to study of all the books which might once have existed of by the prophets, we can narrow down these fragments and we can see, okay, these fragments must be from one of these prophets, most likely. So we just have a lot of material, a lot of prophetic books and fragments in the Dead Sea Scrolls, 
which confirm to us that First and Second Chronicles is correct, what it says, that there were prophetic books, which was the source of some of the books in our Bible, and but they have gotten lost somehow. And we have to question how that could possibly be. Uh, the, the writings of Homer uh, and the writings of Plato were preserved by Christians. They were preserved by Jews in Cots. How could it be that the writings of these prophets were not preserved by the Jews, were not preserved by the Christians? Is, can this be coincidence? How could books that the Bible tells us about be lost? It's clear that they were lost because uh, there's several reasons. One of them is people did not like what they were saying, what they were teaching. So they didn't treasure them. They didn't copy them. Sometimes they were destroyed. And then other times they were never translated into a language that people could read. So if I give you a Chinese writing and you don't speak Chinese, how is that going to help you? You might eventually just throw it out because it's of no use to you. And that's essentially what has happened to a lot of these writings is that no one could read them. No, and they so what was the value of them? So they would just throw them out. And there's much greater, uh, there's much more to the reason of why many of these books got lost. But it's just, uh, it just shows that these schools are very important because it confirms what the Bible has been telling us all along that there are extra books, there are other writings which were part of Scripture, and we have to. If these other writings are scripture, then we have to use what we have and uh, try to incorporate as many of those truths as possible to restore the true faith. And that's what my mission is about. I, I am a scribe, and my role as a scribe is to try to reconstruct the original scriptures to the best of my abilities. Am I going to get it correct? Absolutely in every way, not in any way. But I will tr do my best, and I'm as a scribe, I think it's important to let the readers know what are the differences? I'm gonna, you know, when you read the translations of people, they don't tell many of the differences. There are so many differences, but almost all of the differences are not noted in the Bibles, and I don't think that's a fair thing for seekers of truth. I think you, we all deserve to know what do other versions of the scripture say, so we can test for ourselves. It'd, it'd be like someone, it'd be like someone giving you a, a copy of the Message Bible. If you guys are familiar with that, a very bad translation. It'd be like saying, "Here, here's a, here's the Bible. That's all you get." Hopefully you can get the truth from that. There's not a lot to go on. Very unreliable. In a similar way, you know, if you're just getting the standard version that's from a single manuscript with almost no other indications of what the other copies say, you're missing a huge testimony, which could be hugely significant. And so that's what my role is of trying to make a version of the Bible which notes these differences for people, translates them in a way that people can understand them, and decide for themselves, should this be part of the Bible? Is this scripture? Are, are, are these word, Were these words removed by scribes? And should they be part? No, so these are questions we all need to be asking. Now, there comes a time in everyone's life when they realize the corruption of scripture. You have to make two choices. You come to a crossroads. Do you abandon the Bible and the faith altogether? And many go that path. Atheists, people who have converted to Islam, uh, all kinds of, you know, they just... They realize the scripture is corrupt, and they they used to be they used to be true believers, from what they understood to be true believers. You know, they they, they were very sincere in their faith, and they believed all the stuff that the church taught. But when they realized that that's not true, they abandoned it altogether. Because a lot of people think if the scriptures are so corrupted, then what's the point of reading them? You know, they're they're not reliable, they're not trustworthy, so we, there's no point in wasting my time. That's the one road to go. There's the other road to go, okay, there's corruption, but now let's try to figure out what the original Bible said. See if we can do that. And that's called textual criticism, and that's what scholars do, not just with the Bible, but books of all kinds of writings. And I believe that other, that approach is the way to go, not to abandon the Bible. And it is my perspective from everything I've seen, uh, all the differences of the scribes and manuscripts, that the scriptures are much more reliable than what it might seem, and that I don't think they're unreliable or untrustworthy, uh, even despite corruptions like that. And the reason for that is, if you have a message uh, someone's trying to preserve, and someone condenses that message, they're still trying to convey that message. The, the role of a scribe is to convey the message to the people. If you, like, as a translator, when you're, when you're translating to someone, you're trying to convey the message from someone. Let's say someone speaks a sentence that is 50 words long, and you translate it in another language eight words long, but you convey the point. Uh, then that is basically, it's not, those eight words are re reliable and they're trustworthy, but they're not the original words, but they are trustworthy uh, 
to an extent. And so that's how I view the scriptures as well. I don't view them as complete, unreliable documents. I view them as the, the scribes. The scribes who were copying the scriptures, they accepted these documents as scripture. So they weren't going to try to destroy the scriptures and corrupt them. They wanted to preserve the message as best as they thought they could do. And so with that in mind, we realized that the, the corruptions in scripture were not done to lead us astray. They were not done intentionally to, to try to destroy our faith. They were done with the belief that they were best preserving the message for that generation. So with that in mind, we can not be so disheartened by this. We should not like lose our faith over this. I think in many ways it can, for, for me, it has enhanced my faith so many ways and has really changed my life. Uh, so um, how much time do I have left? Also, in the Dead Sea Schools that was found, uh, there was writings by the, the, uh, the, who I believe to be the Essenes. Others don't believe they were the Essenes, but basically it's the whoever were behind these Dead Sea Schools. It seems like they wrote a lot of writings, too. According to Josephus, uh, these, these people were prophetic. They were prophets. You know, the, the, the gift of prophecy ceased among the Pharisees, but it didn't cease among the Essenes or the Dead Sea Scroll writers. And so we've got many prophetic books. There's the War Scroll, there's Damascus Document, Community Rule, the Pesher Documents. And these Pesher Documents speak with an inspiration that is very powerful. The, the Pesher Documents basically are the... It's like a commentary. It's like an official commentary. It's like the, the word Pesher is what word that is found in the Book of Daniel. And in the Book of Daniel, we see that word pressure there and it's the authoritative interpretation of the dreams that the uh, Nebuchadnezzar had or maybe it was someone else but um and in the same way, that's what these Essenes tried to do. They tried to give the pressure or the authoritative interpretation of the standard books of scripture. The uh, the books of the prophets and like, there's like a pressure of Isaiah, a pressure of Habakkuk. The pressure of Habakkuk was the best preserved pressure of all the pressures. But so I'm afraid our time's up today, my friends, with Jackson Snyder Presents, but we'll follow this on in the next show because I know we're all desperate to hear about sedition, bloody murder, retribution, and other acts of saving grace. My friends and I have everything we need. And where I am is good enough for me. I say Jackson Snyder presents. We will examine the life of our master Yashua by discovering his ancestors, family, and friends, by reviewing rare ancient manuscripts, and speaking to those who know him best. From the Vero Essene Yahad, now experience, Jackson Snyder presents. Today with me, brother Shrumpoff, sitting here at the editing booth with a big cup of Shroom coffee this morning and enjoying the wonderful fellowship from all these great scene here on top of Mount Goshen in Tennessee. You can hear in the background, you can hear all kind of children, you can hear people talking back there about holy things and reading a scripture, praying and eating. We're eating grit today and uh, some kind of egg casserole. It's very good. I decided this morning also to have a glass of uh, sun up. Sun up it call. It tastes like, kind of like uh, grapefruit. I don't know what, but it's 
something you should try, especially mixing that with sting coffee? I, it's wonderful, that's all I can say. I wish I could introduce these things to the old country back in Ukraine, but uh, they don't take to new things very much, and I've never heard them mix coffee and soda before, so. Anyway, we have the second part of Onya Carlson, Desi Scroll Teasers. Very, very popular recording and teaching. And here at boot camp, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls being taught every night from a scholarly perspective. Here is the end of the teasers, and then later on, we'll get into some of the thick dough of the bread of life. Hallelujah. Amen. I believe we can see divine inspiration in these co commentaries, and uh, they they help us understand who the Essenes were and uh, the proper way of interpreting some of these prophetic books. And uh, there was also documents of the calendar uh, in the scrolls. I believe they were, they were written by David, but I don't really have any proof of that necessarily. But there is a reference in Chronicles of uh, David and Solomon writing uh, writing about the calendar, or I don't know if it said the calendar, but it said basically a priestly roster for the temple service, and that seems very similar to what these calendar documents in the scrolls read like. The, the calendar documents chart the calendar dates according to the priesthood, so it seems to me that's a very good theory to indicate that these calendar documents may very well be what David and Solomon wrote for the priestly roster for calendar service. Uh, so, let's see, is there anything else in the Dead Sea Scrolls to, um, see, Th those are the main things, I mean, let me, let me see, I can take out my paper, oh, that's yeah, a while ago, that's a while ago. Uh, yeah, there is time for questions, but I just want to say one final thing is, um, uh, I have a mission for, as I said, I have the Bible Project thing, but I also have many other things of, like, uh, I think it's important to study history, um, uh, Matthew, uh, Parrot the other day was talking about well, what about all these other religions? Uh, you know, we're, we're just uh, we are Americans, but we're so interested only in, in Judaism, the writings of the Hebrew Bible. And uh, I, I have a website. Uh, I need to update it and add more stuff. But basically, there's writings of all kind of other groups, and it's amazing to see in Greek literature of pagans as well as in Egyptian literature so many similarities uh, between the Bible. Uh, and so it, it's not just for that, but there's, I believe history is important for the sake of history, even if it has no connection to the Bible whatsoever. We shouldn't get lost in it so that we forget uh, to study the important things. I think it's important to study these other writings, so I, uh, I have a website where I've loaded many PDF files of ancient writings, and I hope to add more in the future. So I have that, and I also have a, a website for the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, a friend of mine bought a used laptop, uh, and on this used laptop was the entire set series of the GJ. That is an amazing value. Are you kidding? No. A used old laptop? Yeah, from uh, one of... He, he, he went to a college uh, who some of his professors are these scholars, like, yeah. and uh, he, he bought the used laptop from one of these guys or something. And the entire series was in PDF form on this, so he sent me he sent me copies of it, and um, this was like a couple of years ago. It's a fortune. I know. So basically, the value of this is priceless. Oh. It, yeah, basically, if you were to get a new, if you were to get in book form the new copies of the entire series, it's over thirteen thousand dollars. If you were to get PDF copies of it all uh, to pay you and pay for it. Or if you get used copies, it'd still be, I'm sure it'd be thousands of dollars. And my friend got it for free, he sent it to me for free, so I have it on my website. You guys can download it. Uh, I, I've had that for a couple years. Um, and it's the it's the official scholarly edition, so it has all their commentary, you know, so it's, it goes into much greater detail than what you're going to see in who was it up there that has a, especially not the scriptures. To sell those books for thirteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, I mean, that is tantamount to stealing from you knowledge. You can't have this, you're not rich enough, yeah. you're not smart enough. Exactly. Uh, yeah. uh, I don't know if anybody's aware, but in, in Judaism, you cannot destroy a document that has Yahweh's name in it. So they would bury them or they would put them in tombs. And how ironic that they possibly that's where these documents came from because maybe there was a minor discrepancy in in a letter or a 
a sentence or whatever, so they couldn't use those scrolls, so they put them in a tomb. Do you think it's going to pick up what she was saying? Should it pick up? Okay, I'm recording. Uh, well, so here's an interesting thing. Some scholars have stated that as, as a theory, but uh, there's several points you know, against that explaining what we have found. And those two points are we have some copies of the scrolls where the name is not written out. There's four dots, which is substitution. And so, as you were saying, you know, they might have buried, they might have buried these scrolls because his name was written out in them. Well, in those scrolls where the divine name was not written out, that wouldn't apply that they argument. Could have destroyed this scroll. Yeah, they could have destroyed yeah. exactly. And now, uh, also, what I believe is against that idea is in many writings, uh, in many of the scrolls that were found, there were there were mistakes made. Right. But instead of just throwing it out, what you see is like some of what we do is like, well, we just cross it out and write it above the line or things like that, where well, basically it shows that they're, they're not just throwing it out because they make a mistake, but they're just like, okay, well, uh, we need to make as much use of these resources as possible. So we'll just, there, there was one, there was one fragment or scroll where apparently like, they were writing and they couldn't fit everything, so like the scribe started writing on the side and then upside down and uh, all kinds of things. My crazy parents, things. Um, before they became non believers, had the only messianic congregation in Georgia and they had gotten a Torah scroll. And the scroll was very old, it was pre Holocaust, and you could see where they cut out pieces and inserted a new piece in that spot. So, you know, same thing. They, there may yeah. have been a mistake they found later on after it was written. They, it off and the scribes fixed it. Yeah. yeah. Well, in, in the Nazarene literature that had the sacred name in it, they, in the Mishnah, it says that they, they cut the sacred name off and burn the book. They actually would cut them off and preserve those right. pieces and then burn the book. Right. And that's wasteful. Yeah. Yeah. I had a question for you. You had mentioned this. Uh, you're talking about how they were all the songs for the, um, the Sabbath and for each day and for the feast. I think when you didn't mention the feast, you mentioned 30 feasts or something. I was wondering if you, in some of these scrolls that you're reading about, have you seen things show up for the four days of Enoch? Um, the thing is, like, you know, with the 30, the songs for the 30 festivals, most of those have not really been preserved even in fragments much at all, it seems. Uh, but the, the thing I've realized is that there's different ways to count these feasts. Um, and you can count it in a way that uh, the, the, those four days are necessary. And you can also count it, like, you know, the, the, the word new month uh, or new moon in... Standard Judaism, it's understood as every every lunar month, it's a holy day, uh, and there's 12 in a year. In the understanding of Enoch and Jubilees and the Ketishul songs, uh, it's understood as only there's only four new month days, which are holy days. And the count of 30, what I saw was that it seemed like there was different ways you could count it with... with uh, you could do the 12 lunar months, but then I think you weren't able to count the extra holy days that the Temple Skull introduces. Whereas if you count those extra days the Temple Skull introduces, then you have to only have the four to make it 30. And part of the, part of the reason I'm asking this question is like, what, like we see some of these feasts and we don't see some of these other feasts in other books. Like certain, certain feasts may be missing in other books, we not really or such. And then uh, some of them might be in additional ones. But what I'm wondering mostly is, are these four days in Enoch, are they, are you finding them maybe in like the Testaments of the Patriarchs? Are you finding them in the Temple Scrolls? Are you finding these feasts like, you know, in the War Scroll, the Matthew, yeah. whatever? The problem with the Temple Scroll is it's fragmentary in certain parts, especially at the beginning. But in the Temple Scroll, there is a passage which scholars reconstruct. I believe they interpret that incorrectly. Basically, what, it, what the scholars tell us is that it seems to say that the, in the Temple Scroll that the first day of the first month of the year is a holy day we're not to do any work on. I believe that's reconstructed incorrectly in their understanding and that there's in the missing text media, immediately beneath that it was basically saying the new month or the beginnings of the first month the fourth the seventh 
and the tenth. But again, the rest of it wasn't preserved. But that right there shows that our copies of the Torah do not say on the first of the month of the, on the first of the first month don't do work. It doesn't say that. But in the Temple Scroll, it does say that. So that kind of corresponds with what Jubilee says about those four holy days are are days. Uh, well, it doesn't say in Jubilees that they are days not to do work on, but it treats those four extra days on the same level as all the other holy days that the Torah says not to do work on. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Where does, I don't want to eat it. It doesn't have any, to my recollection, there, are, there is really no significance to those days other than they're set apart I, where else do, where do we find something that tells us that those days are to be Shabbat well according to Jubilees those four days were introduced by Noah they were first observed as sacred by Noah so it would make sense if Jubilees statement is correct that uh, Enoch wouldn't talk about it because he was writing before uh, Noah would institute it um now, there is, a, is in the book of Amos, for example, the book of Amos su suggests from what it puts in the mouth of the sinful Israelites, where they talk about how, oh, we have to wait until the Sabbath is over so we can buy and sell. Oh, we have to wait until the new month or new moon, as they translate it, is over until we can buy and sell. So Amos is a testimony to the new month, holy day, being a day where no work is to be done. Um, but again, our copies of Torah don't say that. It doesn't say that the new month's days are not to be done, and yet Amos is a testimony to this. I believe tes uh, I believe the Temple Scroll is a testimony to that as well. So we call those like Noah days? Yeah, Noah days. And also, yeah, intercalary days. Yep. I know some people that talk about keeping a first day uh, feast, and uh, I was looking. It does seem like in our Old Testament scriptures of Tanakh that there's an inference to first days occasionally. It's not super obvious, but I was wondering maybe those could be those four days. It's a new moon feast that, that there's a liturgy for. We used to do it. So we got all the liturgy for it. What does the Nazi say about it? I, I have a question, and not being antagonistic or anything, just trying to understand better what it was that, that you said. Yeah. Um, you referred to the hypothesis theory, or the uh, documentary hypothesis, as it seemed to me, in the way that I took it, that you seem to uh, feel light about it, that it's not valid, or is, is that your position? That the, Documentary hypothesis is a figment of someone's imagination. Um, uh, my perspective on that is, I think that the documentary hypothesis is based on a flawed concept, and that is that the Masoretic text is like they're basically basing it off Masoretic text. And I think, in order for the documentary hypothesis to still hold validity, I think it needs a complete reanalysis with a renewed understanding of what the Torah. Was in its uh, in an older form because, as I suggested, there seems to be to me some evidence that, like from the Dead Sea Scrolls, Samaritan, and Septuagint, that the Masoretic text is actually a very late form, highly edited uh, version of the law. And so, if we're basing the documentary hypothesis on the Masoretic version, it seems almost like we could easily come to false conclusions based on changes made by the Masoretes. So, I guess I'd be more interested in seeing would the documentary hypothesis still hold uh, ground with a different version of the Torah that might have been even preceding the Masoretic. What about the Temple Scroll? I mean, well, I don't think it holds up all well, the Temple Scroll. Right now, let me, let me, let me follow up on that because, um, you know, it, I find what you, what you've got to say very interesting and a valid point. The Masoretic text was what was available at the time that the uh, documentary hypothesis surfaced uh, shortly before critical of uh, Critical analytical thing of, of scripture, textual criticism, that's what it's called, right? Okay. These things all came about at a time that seemed historically that the Masoretic text was all that was available to them because the other things had been boarded up and taken from both the public domain and we really didn't have anything 
to go by other than what the Sadducees or the, the Pharisees, rabbis, gave us this definition. So, I will tell you uh, that that hypothesis should be expounded to look into the apocryphal also. Uh, I hear you, or I thought I heard you say, so I'm going to ask you the question about um, the scribes. You seem to insinuate that there was no, nothing that the scribes were doing wrong other than maybe just following orders from the redactors, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, was there, was, was the Navi just having a bad day whenever that <laughs> scripture got in, a, in there about the line, line pins and scribes, or is there some validity to that in your opinion? I think there's, uh, when, when, you know, in Jeremiah, as you said, uh, the lying pen of the scribes, and I think, uh, I think we have to make a distinction between uh, intentional falsehood and unintentional falsehood, and I think the scribes I think the scribes uh, were, like, you know, it's, it's always interesting of how translations can, the way it's translated can uh, obfuscate uh, sometimes what the original passage was meaning. And so I find a interesting nuance between lying or falsehood, you know, because in many ways I think lying almost implies a sinister, you know the truth, or you know what you think is the truth, and you're distorting it. Very, very, very good point there, because the scribes were simply the secretaries for the people that were in charge, and they did exactly what they were told. I recall of the monks that were sent to the monastery under a vow of silence and gave them, gave them just a very short piece of scripture to translate, and they weren't allowed to talk about it. There seemed to be uh, an overshadowing, uh, I think, seems to me, sinister plot to keep the truth from the common folk. So um, I, I, I can see your defense of the scribes because they were just following orders. The guy go up line to find the guilty culprits that actually did the things that we know that they did, which was to destroy the ancient documents that keep the truth from us. Um, your opinion on that? Um, I view the scribes, at least some of them. I think I think uh, I think the practices of scribes were probably much broader than what we might think and so like for instance how i do my scribal work i don't answer to an authority i just use my best judgment <gasps> looking at all the differences in the different copies and trying to correct if i think there's an error and i'll say oh that's probably an error and i'll try to uh present the text that i think is the most accurate and i think there may have been some of that going on by some of the scribes in ancient times where they doubted some of the passages and, or they weren't sure about it or I think certain passages to them seemed hard for them to understand, or they didn't know how to... Uh, it's just different things where I think it's a very complex issue of... I don't see it so much as... Uh, again, with like the language like with Sinister, I see it as an evil, something evil that happened behind this. But I don't necessarily see it as Sinister in the sense of uh, that they were intentionally trying to uh, hide what they knew the truth was from the people, I think they may have themselves convinced themselves that uh, some of these things maybe were, you know, like scholarship. A lot of scholars, uh, they look at the copies of the Bible and they say, well, these are interpolations. And so it's very possible in ancient times, some of the scribes or some of the higher leaders had a similar critical mindset of skepticism, and when they read certain things, they were like, oh, this seems perhaps it was added at a later time, and they might have it may remove certain things for that reason. Uh, I guess the way I say, I, I, from what I've seen in the scribal tendencies, that there seems to be less sinister motives for a large portion of the change that were made. Maybe there are some, maybe there could be some, uh, we should be open to the idea that there were some changes made which were sinister, but I think, I believe we should give the benef benefit of the doubt uh, in terms of Unless we have absolute evidence that there was like uh, intentional intentional wickedness that they they knew they knew it was like a horrible thing that they were doing uh, to try to conceal the truth, and we should try to say it may have happened sometimes, but we'll try to assume the best of them because uh, I, I I think 
I always try when testing all writings is to be as fair as possible and not assume that they were lying or had a sinister motive because it very very well could be wrong on some of these things and I don't want to be uh, I don't want to be judged for wrongly judging someone's motives or intentions because I've seen that happen too many times so that's just my perspective I have errors or misspellings transpositions and dropping of words Okay, those so are the early 90%. Yes, right. Uh, only, I, I want to say that being you in person uh, has uh, enlightened me to the path that you've been put on. I applaud your, uh, oh boy, your, your bite. That's what you're doing is biting off a big old chunk. And I applaud you for that. And I hope that within my lifetime that you will finish this so that it can be put out there for us to look at. Uh, that is quite a feat that you have set before yourself, and without the help of the Most High, it, it, it's not going to happen. So uh, I look forward to seeing the finished product. I appreciate it. I, well, I, I want to say that I do have an intention of, uh, well, everything I do, I'm going to release freely. There will also be a book version, which will, you might have to pay for the, the material to, but, uh, Everything I'm going to release for free, and I want to, like, for each book that I do, I'm going to release that book. Like, I don't want to just say, well, you're going to have to wait until the whole thing's finished. So basically, you'll get you'll get pieces as I finish them to see. And so, I don't know if it's going to finish the entire thing before some people's lifetime here, but uh, I think you will be seeing at least some of it, and it will give you an idea of what's out there. Oh, yeah. I want to get one comment and then one question. Um, you said earlier there wouldn't need to be laws against polygamy if people weren't putting polygamy. Well, beloved, we have to take a little break now. We'll be back when it's finished, promise. Just as I promised, Jackson Snyder Prevent is back now to finish up message and fulfill promise. So there wouldn't be need a law against blasphemy if people weren't committing blasphemy. I'm not saying Scott's committed blasphemy, but purposely misrepresenting, but yeah. that law is there for a reason to keep people from doing it. My second question is, and kind of operating in a broader context, do you have any knowledge of the Chinese Yahweh, Shangi, or, or can you bring anything to the table about that? Uh, not too much. All I can say is I know that, uh, well, we all go back to, to Noah, and I think there are amazing similarities in all different religions. At one time, in 2012, I was kind of going on a... I was getting a little bit too carried away with trying to add things into the Bible, and... Uh, I was considering the possibility that, you know, every religion may have been originally the Jew religion at one point. I was incorporating the Quran as scripture, uh, Plato's writings. I was even thinking, oh, probably Hindu writings, some of those are probably scripture. But as I started, you know, reading and studying them, I, I saw discrepancies I couldn't reconcile between the two different faiths. There just seemed to be too many differences. Uh, the Quran I held on to the longest for about nine months. But uh, basically... So I think there may be some legitimacy to certain things in Chinese culture or religion that may have connections with the faith. Uh, but I did want to say something about what you said about the law and sort of in relation to what Jackson had said. And I think, I don't necessarily think we can assume that because there's a law that there were people actively doing it in their community. Uh, I think, for example, you can you can make a law uh, condemning what you see in other groups in that are contemporary with you. And also, like we just have to look at uh, governments of our world today, when they form their constitutions or when they make new laws, uh, some of those laws are based on laws that have, like, event, uh, things that happened much prior to that. So basically, I, I don't think necessarily laws have to be something that's correct, like, against something that's happening. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, can, it can be something that's like, this very well could happen, so let's make some laws to prevent this from happening. I think there is that type of 
enacting laws to prevent horrible things from happening. So this is a, be a good time to stop. This is right. about a little after six. That's a wonderful dissertation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. He's going to be back at seven thirty, yeah. and uh, we're going to continue on for if you want to come. And at nine o'clock, if you're late at all, we'll do Revelation Unplugged. We'll do new the dispensationalist theory. And I, I think we probably need to do it inside someplace. And I was going to ask the Sarge here to maybe tell us where. Are we going to have me? Uh, Really not. We have me in the same place uh, inside some somewhere else, or are we doing me here and then moving? No, no, we'll be, we'll be in the same place. Okay. Two coming, two going around here. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. It's still recording, so if you want, to, it's still recording, so if you want, uh, I don't know how to turn it off. Unless, oh, unless you still want it to record. Sure, I'll I'll say okay. Okay. Hey, I just got a thought question on documentary. Uh, and that is the if documentary uh, hypothesis uh, is true, uh, then it has to be older than our oldest manuscripts. And if it is older than our oldest manuscripts, then my question or thought would be is it possible that the Samaritan, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the. And, no, hold on. And the Septuagint are all based on an older ancient document. Yeah. Except the Temple Scrolls all in first person. It's a unified work. Do you understand my question? I'm saying documentary hypothesis has to be older than the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint, all that. If that's the case, is it possible that the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint, and the Samaritan Pentateuch all have a similar base source? That's a good question. Yeah. I wanted to get on the recording, but it's well, uh, still recording. Well, yeah. uh, well, let me just say, since we're still recording, um, he might delete this part, whatever. Uh, uh, I think, like, when you look at the, when you look at the documentary hypothesis, I only looked at it a little bit, but they did a color coding of which parts they thought were yeah. which one, and uh, I saw that Genesis had the most like divergence, and for me. Like the Genesis Apocryphon theory is a great uh, answer to what seems to be so many different authorship in Genesis. So that very well could be a... Uh, well, part of the documentary hypothesis makes Deuteron D Deuteronomus as its own source. So the temple source, or the temple scroll, could be D, yeah. potentially. And Genesis Exodus is almost all uh, one, I believe. And then you have uh, Levitical is obviously one. So it's possible that maybe what we do the, like, uh, the J or the E is based on the Genesis of Oxford instead of our Genesis, you know. Or... Yeah. Thank you, man. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, something interesting that not a lot of, not a lot of two people know about uh, is in copies of numbers in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are certain chapters which, like I said, in a different order in Dead Sea Scroll copies. So it's just, I think the documentary hypothesis based on the, the tour we have is not a good thing. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great job, man. Thank you. Only 